Welcome back to We Watch the Chosen So You Don't Have To, presented by You Have Permission, the podcast that aims to take both Christianity and the modern world of science and culture very seriously. My name is Dan Koch. I'm a licensed therapist and a post-evangelical liberal Protestant. Jeff, how do you describe yourself these days? Well, I think last time I, I might have described myself as a an orthodox mystic, um, but yeah. really really finding myself agreeing with probably far too much of um, Logos Bible Church's statements of faith. Um, <laughs> referring but, to last episode, yeah. Yeah, yeah, referring yeah. to last time I was on. But yeah, no, I think I'm a, I am, you know, I'm part of an, of a Protestant evangelical church. I grew up in, I grew up in the church as we talked about last time. I'm yeah. currently a worship leader, but I'm still the type of person that is, you know, um, loves to, loves to discuss and loves to think about um, the vastness of what we're talking about and the mystery of what we're talking about, but also still holding firm to, um, you know, what I consider to be primary uh, elements of, you know, the Christian faith or, and happy to discuss the secondary and tertiary things. I love that. Uh, today we are continuing uh, our romp, our tromping through The Chosen, the yeah. television show depicting the life of Jesus and his disciples. And today we're covering season one, episodes two and three of The Chosen. Uh, after a quick game that we're going to play, I will recap the plot and then we're going to get into all manner of reactions and tangents, including the quality of writing on the show, miracle workers, family dynamics, and romantic norms in the first century, a <laughs> neurodivergent Matthew, wow. radical conversion experiences, PTSD, aesthetics in religion, Jesus being good with kids, and plenty more. Um, this is There's a lot to dive into here. I think so too, yeah. Especially in this in the second episode, but yes, also episode in the third two as well. has so yeah. much. There's going to be a lot more from episode two than episode three, which yeah. we'll which we'll get into. Last time we 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 don't have to do a lot of this because we mapped ourselves kind of theologically. Basically, I'm hanging off the left side of the theological cliff by a f couple fingers, and you're somewhere <laughs> more like I would say center left within evangelical yeah. Protestantism, maybe center right fair. in the broader American cultural landscape or something like that. Um, yeah, I or, think I would or say just I'm like in the middle, in, in the radical middle somewhere, but yeah, radical probably middle in the middle, okay. yeah. <laughs> but probably a, I would say in, in my circle of, of friends, I'm probably in the, you know, center left, but yeah, yeah maybe in other circles, I might be considered center, right. Who's but, to yeah, say, who's to say, who's and honestly, say? I don't really trust the people who are worrying about it too much. I'm just glad that you, the MAGA hat is off out of the frame. Oh gosh, you know? please don't do that. <laughs> That's a joke. No, okay, That's yeah. a joke. Okay. So we, we call this, we watch the chosen. So you don't have to, uh, because the chosen has to be the most recommended show by Christians to other people in the history of Christian media, maybe not <laughs> since the passion of the Christ. Um, but actually we're finding a lot to like about it, finding plenty yeah. to talk about. I wanted to start with actually a little bit of listener feedback very briefly, uh, even though we have a lot to cover. So Tommy had something really helpful to say about episode one and Lilith, a.k.a. Mary Magdalene's demon possession, that the show hmm. seems to um, intimate that the demon possession was and the violence of all that was actually a response to trauma in her life, that hmm. it wasn't like some disconnected spiritual thing. We get that image of the flashback of her being what appears to be raped by a Roman centurion. Right. I mean, they, they're trying to make this show like family friendly to some degree. And so they're not yeah. showing all of that stuff the way in HBO, like HBO's Rome would show that for instance. Right. Uh, and I thought that was a good point. Like, I like that, that they're, it's not just like, Oh, there's a spiritual realm and she happens to have demons randomly. Mm -hmm. It's like, they're giving a reason for her to be in this state that then yeah. Jesus heals her from at the end of that episode. I thought that that yeah. was a good point. That's a good point. What's up, Tommy? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I think that's a good point, and I'm sure there's a lot of different ways. And you were even beginning to talk about the different, you know, the the movement or the the line between you know the spiritual side of it and the and maybe the mental health side of it. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that's I think that's super interesting. A few listeners or YouTube viewers actually did not think that the show portrayed Mary as a prostitute. And I think my take is they don't hit you over the head with it, but I think that that's probably that family friendly thing that I'm mentioning. 
there it does it did definitely seem to me to be a heavy implication she lives in the red quarter a client quote unquote is fleeing at one point she's familiar with people in the local bar where a man is hitting on her apparently for sex so yeah. i i think that that's just about keeping it at the implication level is more about um audience but mm-hmm. is that you you have the same takeaway right i think so too yeah i think that there's a there's a big piece of what they're who they know their audience is and what they're, you know, what they're comfortable with kind of, I, I can't assume too much, but what they're comfortable yeah. with kind of getting into. Yeah. Also got interesting mixed reactions on that final scene from episode one where yeah, Jesus knows say? Mary's name. So one person said that was the most impactful scene in the entire series. So it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> I, you just well, turn this off now. <laughs> that's really funny. I, I it's if, if it's possible to agree with, with both thing, not both, but if it's possible yeah. to agree that that's one of the most impactful um, scenes in the whole show, but it also, the show also still improves in my opinion. I think yeah. both things, at least for me, I oh, think great. both things are possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And then, but then another person felt kind of weird about that scene, hmm. especially given the sex work context of that scene. Hmm. Uh, and that like, you know, it, it just um, around consent and like mm. just showing up and knowing her name, it's, you know, it's like, that's tough because of course we don't know if a moment like that ever happened. And if it did mm. happen, we don't actually know where the people were stationed in the room and, yeah. you know, like, uh, but the way that it was filmed, someone felt like it was just, it felt actually kind of weird to them given okay. that sort of sex work context. And then here's a perspective John essentially, but it's Jesus. Mm, okay. um, I don't know. Just interesting. People yeah, have different I mean, reactions to art. Sure. Yeah. I mean, people are going to see all different types of things, especially in a show like this. I definitely didn't think about it that way, but yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, I did find, like I was thinking about that scene and I found a, a cool blog post, a guy named Kevin Keating, who blogs at the Bible artist. And uh, here's What's a up, quote Kevin? F- from his blog, but I like, that's a good bit. Keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, quote, as a general rule, the characters who follow Jesus aren't bad people. They're misunderstood and rejected and in need of love. When they're engaged in sin, it's often a result of their difficult circumstances or their status as outsiders. And so what they primarily need is love and acceptance, not forgiveness and repentance. Thus, mm. when Jesus first encounters Mary, What he offers her isn't forgiveness for her life of prostitution. It's relief from the oppressive demons that drove her to the type of life that she's lived. Mm. I just loved that. I thought, yeah, I mean, that squares with my understanding of Christianity. It also feels uh, it squares with my reading of the show uh, and what they were trying to do in that scene. And I just thought that was really well put. And of course, like it majorly relates to my work as a therapist and Mm -hmm. how psychological education has made me rethink things like sinful people and Mm -hmm. living in sin and all that stuff. It's, it tends to be pain, suffering, rejection, you know, these things that people go through, that's not like them just like setting out to sin. Right. That's leading uh, them to to this. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, I think that's, I, I, I love these kind of listener responses or these quotes about the show because- uh, you know, I'm only viewing it from my little perspective, you know, over here right. in outside of Philadelphia and in, involved in a church, grew up in, you know, Buffalo, New York, went to a very Pentecostal church. My parents, you know, my parents love a show like The Chosen and somehow we're talking about the show, The Chosen on a little bit more of a progressive podcast. So I think it's it's interesting, the spectrum of people who are watching this this show and thinking about it. Totally. And that's what good art should do is it should, there should be things in it for different people to find and react to, right? Good art does not only reach like one tribe of people that mo that's why most evangelical made art is bad actually. And that's already what I'm appreciating about the chosen is that, and how that's uh, maybe so far the number one way through three episodes that it is breaking from other evangelical media that I've consumed is and this is one of the things that I was going to get it into a little bit later, but we can we can jump ahead just for this one. Hmm. It's good TV writing. It is like sure. in episode two, the way that they use the Shabbat Sabbath dinner as a mechanism for tying all these stories together within one like fifty minute or so yeah. episode. Like that's just good. That's just what good television. That's does. good writing. 
Yeah. Um, and we were watching. Yeah, and, and it's almost it's good like writing, and we it's good pacing and plotting. Mm -hmm. And it's, I was going to say it almost takes you, especially since you're kind of new to the show, it almost. And it almost takes you a few episodes to to accept the fact that this that this is actually pretty good because what we talked about with kind <laughs> yeah. of like Christian our right. assumptions about Christian entertainment right like right um, especially TV and movies we we found tons of good Christian bands in our you know in our yeah young you know, youthful, yeah yeah in our tooth and nail days and all that kind of stuff but w with TV and movies it's like I am going to assume that this is probably not going to be good and you're pro you know as you move through episodes two three four and beyond you're going to be like okay there's actually some really really yeah. interesting and thoughtful writing in in this show so yeah yeah and you know it's like I knew that they had good production value. I knew that yeah. going in. I knew it was going to look good. It is, by the way, quite dark, though. Have you noticed this? It's, it is dark. I have dark. to make I, sure my TV is always on the brightest setting. Totally. I agree. And it's like I'm, on the Ozark dark. It's Ozark dark, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, like, actually, speaking of other shows, like, we were watching Hacks last night before bed, which is a comedy mm. on, on Max that I love. Okay. And they did something with some plot points in that, in this new season, with, like, setting up these emotional payoffs, basically. Right. And I was just thinking this morning, the chosen did a better job of setting up emotional payoffs with the Shabbat dinner episode than hacks did with this two episode arc around these, you know, she hangs out with these old comedians and then she's going hiking and, and they're doing yeah. all like, it's the same They're It's TV writers trying to do the same thing. And the chosen guys did it better. That they did. guys and gals writers room did yeah. it better. And I was like, wow, okay. Hats off, you know? The, yeah. They both like in those first two episodes, especially they both, you know, like in music, they both wrote like an amazing outro to the song that really kind yeah. of just like, that just was like the payoff. Right. And, and that's or how like both the of first those... scene in uh, the first scene in episode one, which is Mary and her dad oh. and they're reciting the Kiddush. Yeah. This ancient Israelite home right uh to god and then the end of the second scene she's now hosting shabbat dinner right. having been not now not totally healed by the way from her demon slash ptsd which also i liked and we'll, we'll mm. get to that later yeah like that pays off at the end of episode two in a way that like smart tv pacing works yeah. and i was just like wow okay yeah there's still some stuff i don't love i don't love all sure. the acting i, I think about yeah. half the actors are kind of bad uh, and I'm not, I won't name names. Yeah. Uh, but like the writing has, has me right now. And that's been fun. Totally. Yep. No, I, I'm with you. Okay. You want to play a game? Sure. So we did a game. We sort of did a game last time where we went through Logos <laughs> Bible Church's <laughs> statement of faith. Uh, this is more like a proper game show game. Okay. So well. uh, I'm going to give you 60 seconds, Jeff. And the question I'm going to ask you is how many details activities, dishes, other characteristics of a modern day Shabbat dinner can you name in 60 seconds? Oh. So I have already done, I did this myself so that it wouldn't influence us. I already recorded a 60 second voice memo, which I'll play after you go. So we're competing on a level playing field here. Uh, and then since recording mine, I found a list of common characteristics that I will compare our answers to. Oh my gosh. And uh, after reading through it, I'm already embarrassed at how poorly I did. Um, but I, I can't imagine that I would do any better. Well, we're about to find out. So your 60 seconds begins now. Modern day Shabbat dinner. Like right now. Right now, go. Three, to, okay. two, one, Three, two, start. one. Start. I mean, I know that there's like no no technology in, involved or, you know, okay. the, the, the entire previous day, there's, you know, everyone's kind of putting all their tech away up until this. Yeah. You're at 12 seconds. Moment. So you don't need, you oh, just, that, just list them. Yeah. How about, and there's probably some bread. Um, <laughs> bread <laughs> might not be specific enough. <laughs> close, okay, keep close, going. close family, close friends. Yeah. Oh, um, yes. Close associates. Uh, a, a nice, um, table spread. Um, some sort of yeah, you're like I don't know about that table spread. Um, I mean, any, any some meal. sort of reciting of 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 scripture ah, or something in good. that in that realm of uh, yep. some sort of tradition traditional element of reciting of scripture. I don't know if there's yep. an element of like ten seconds con, con, confession, um, but I, 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 probably not. And then finally, low lighting. 
<laughs> that's cheating because the entire series of the chosen takes place yeah. either outside in the punishing okay. hey, sun or in low light. You okay. have to give me credit for that. You answer. did better than me. Let's let's hear really? my take on this. I, you almost definitely did better than me. Wow. All right, so here was my uh answer. Okay. So I'm assuming there are some food items. Matzo balls. This could be totally wrong. Maybe this is like Passover. I don't know. Unleavened bread. Um, maybe there's a Shabbat dinner. Maybe you could make anything for a Shabbat dinner. I don't know. Um, I would imagine there's some sort of collective, some sort of blessing or prayer that's prayed. Maybe at the beginning. Uh, let's see. You wouldn't have a menorah. That would be Hanukkah. <laughs> I don't know what kind of yeah ornamentation there might be. I just imagine, I mean, I would imagine that observant Jews would wear their yarmulkes, right? If if they do, if the men wear yarmulkes and and there's probably some something for the women that I wouldn't I don't know what it is. Well, I'm not doing very well here. Um yeah, mine is blanking. Really good radio at the end there, Dan. I really um, like that. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't do very well. You, I think you did better. Here is the list I have, and we will compare how we did. I can't so wait to hear the list. So this is courtesy of ChatGPT. We've got candlelight activities, candle lighting, one for Jeff. Uh, the Kiddush, special blessing recited over wine or grape juice. So we both kind of got that one. Then there's a uh, challah, I can't really say challah bread, uh, blessing over two loaves of challah bread, symbolizing the double portion of manna. Uh, there's a meal and conversations, a festive meal with family and friends. There we go. So you got that one. Often filled with songs, storytelling, and engaging conversations. And there is the bur the burkat hamazan. I'm totally don't know how to pronounce Hebrew. A blessing after the meal to thank God. Okay, dishes. We've got challah bread, which neither of us said. Gefilte fish, low hanging fruit. Didn't get that. Chicken soup often served with matzo balls. I you did actually get that one. You got it. Uh, brisket or roast chicken. That sounds nice. Didn't that's I want to go to one. <laughs> please, please, Jewish please friends, invite, invite me. Yeah. Uh, some veggie side dishes and desserts that we didn't talk about, and then characteristics: family and community. It's a family centric event, so you you don't get to count that again. I already counted it. Uh, rest and reflection. It begin. It Ooh. marks the beginning of a day of rest. Uh, I wonder if that's, there's nothing in here about technology. Tech. So we might give you I that one. Said I should have said rest. I'd like a half a point for that. Um, I, I give you a half point for that. Okay. So four and a um, half. Traditional and modern fusion is sort of a mm. characteristic of modern day Shabbat dinners. I guess that makes sense. Kosher observance. Didn't think of this. The, the f food that's is prepared good. kosher. Mm. missed that one we, and then decor and atmosphere the table is often set with special dishes and the atmosphere is celebratory and serene reflecting the sanctity of shabbat i gotta give you a point i really for low think lighting i need a point low, i said low lighting and i even said a nice spread i don't know what i meant yeah. by that but i think that well. yeah <laughs> right now it's How convenient right now it's five and a half to three yeah, I got matzo balls. It didn't say unleavened bread. That might be past. I think that's I still Passover. gave you a point for that. You gave me a point for that. I yarmulkes did. weren't mentioned, but they're wearing yeah, yarmulkes think... in the in the episode. Yeah. Okay. And I did I, that I, before I watched. I beat you, which is kind of amazing considering yeah, you made up the great. question. Yeah. Well, I don't know very much about it. So, <laughs> okay, that brings us to the plot of these Let's two go. episodes, and we will go back through and talk about the stuff that we find most interesting. But here's kind of what happens in episodes two and three. So top of, top of episode two, a recently healed Mary Magdalene prepares for Shabbat or the Sabbath, a Shabbat dinner, first by braiding her hair in a first century beauty salon, complete with multiple chairs facing the same direction, little brass plates as mirrors and drawings of hairstyles that look like ancient icons of Christ. Did you pick up on how much they made this look like a hair salon? Wow. No, I, di I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. Very uh, heavy, heavy production design. Yeah. Uh, Matthew validates Simon's claims of negotiating with Quintus, a.k.a. Megamind, who is helmetless in this episode and a bicked, bald 
heavy with a bulging villainous vein across his forehead. <laughs> Quint. I'm not. I said I was gonna name names, but I don't really like the actor You're who not portrays a fan. Quintus. No, it's like so I hope, he doesn't, to I hope he doesn't listen to this show. I don't think he does. Okay. Okay. Uh, Simon, a real piece of shit at this point in the story, continues oh, wow. to spy on merchants and buys drinks for them and his fellow fishermen, James and John, sons of Zebedee. Mm. They will become important with the approval of the Av Bet Dean, who is like maybe a higher guy than Nicodemus. Nicodemus investigates the reported miracle of Mary's healing in the Red Quarter. We also get a nice little domestic scene between Nico and his wife. And when he finds Mary, she asks to see his official Pharisee papers, which apparently are just uh, some particular piece of cloth. Oh, wow. <laughs> like much easier to make than a fake ID. Yeah. Uh, it just shows her his cloth. That's anyway, hilarious. Yeah. Mary gives to Nicodemus the first ever Christian testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to talk about testimonies and conversion experiences later. Simon tells his wife, Eden, that he must go fishing on the Sabbath. Uh, but during their conversation, there are so many cutaway shots to her chopping cucumbers that I was certain she was going to lose a finger. Did that stress you out? <laughs> I wasn't super stressed about it, but now that you mention it, I'm, I'm five. Glad you... There were five, no fewer than five cutaways to her with wow. the cucumbers and the glad knife. She's okay. And I'm but... like, how good were knives back then? I'm sure they were fine. Yeah. I couldn't concentrate very well. That's As so Mary Magdalene hosts her Shabbat dinner, she receives some surprise guests, including Jesus and his students, Thaddeus and James. Uh, before he arrives, she leaves open a seat for the prophet Elijah, but is then told that's only for Passover. Um, and I got to tell you, Jeff, in the Sherwood years, my old band that we toured together, our drummer, Joe, who's ethnically half Jewish, would always make this joke. Every time there was an extra seat, he would say it's for the prophet Elijah. What's up, Joe? What's up, Joe? <laughs> uh, and that, so that, that just made me happy to yeah. have that in the episode. All right. Nicodemus leads the dinner with the other Pharisees in a gorgeous, ornate setting that contrasts Mary's and Simon and Andrew's more humble settings for their Shabbat dinner. Uh, very effective um, cross-cutting yeah. there. Matthew, still wearing the golden green dress from last week, decides to eat Shabbat with his dog, after deciding not to have it with his family. Mm. Uh, and then leaving the dinner with Andrew and Eden, Simon is approached by the Romans at the Sea of Galilee to spy on the merchants. And the, that episode ends with what I took to be a little Judas foreshadowing mm. Simon as the informant leading the soldiers to the offending party. I imagine we might get sort of even some similar blocking and mm. uh, camera angles and stuff for when we eventually get to the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. and Judas. We'll see. That's my prediction. Good plot summary. Thank you. It's a mix of Wikipedia and, and Chad my GPT. own color. Oh. Not ChatGPT for this. <laughs> on to episode three, which has a lot less going on. It's they, According to Wikipedia, it's AD 26. I'm mm -hmm. not sure where they're marking things because these days, historians think Jesus was probably born in something like th 3 BC. Mm. I think not 1 AD or 0 or whatever. Okay. Yeah. And so I think that's what they're doing. So maybe this is within a year or so of him starting. Oh, I see. His so this ministry. is him. This is him. Tw like twenty nine years later, or or or, or something. Thirty I, I years. I think later. it's yeah. yeah. I think it's meant to be like he's like twenty nine and he's about 30. to start at age thirty yeah. or something like that. Gotcha. So Jesus is out earning his Eagle Scout merit badges, solo camping <laughs> on the outskirts of Capernaum. Uh, I'm making a joke, but actually I did find these scenes uh, pretty profound, which we'll talk about. Yeah. A local girl named Abigail discovers that location, starts playing with his craftsman tools while he's away. He invites her and her friend Joshua uh, to see, or she she brings back her friend Joshua to see Jesus for himself. And Jesus befriends them uh, first by making prodigious fart noises um, <laughs> and then through more means with the friends they bring in the following days. Those friends engage in some light child labor during that time <laughs> while Jesus teaches them about love, prayer, justice, compassion, faith, and wisdom. Yeah, I love That's that. That's Wikipedia's that was, language. That, that was funny. <laughs> and then when the kids ask why Jesus is here, uh, our impression of what he says to them is that he is revealing himself as the Messiah. Hmm. He doesn't exactly say that, um, but he recites the words of prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 61, uh, commonly thought, especially among Christians, to be for foreshadowing uh, the Messiah. 
And after Jesus moves camp, uh, Abigail discovers a gift that he has left for her. And I, I have some stuff to say about that. Hmm. So that's the plot of the two episodes. Yeah. yeah and the second, and they both were short episodes, but especially episode three was what, it was only like 30 minutes, right? Yeah. It's like 30 um, minutes and yeah. really just focuses on Jesus and kids. And that actually, that might be a good place to start. Yeah. Um, I loved how they portray Jesus as genuinely good with kids. So like good. Being silly. Right. Like there's not a, there's not a lot of room for that in a religious community that worships him as God. Yeah. You know, we're not thinking about fart noises, but fart right. noises are great for kids. Oh, they love it. I mean, that's literally my two, two of my son's primary sense of humor would, would come from such sounds. Yeah. I took our four-year-old to monster jam at the Seattle Seahawks stadium. Oh, cool. And we spent this whole evening, much of a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I asked him on our way home, I was like, what was your favorite part of tonight? And he's like, when I said toilet, <laughs> that was his was like, favorite Great. part. That's his favorite part of the night. When yeah. he said toilet. Yeah. Could have saved 150 bucks and just said uh, it at home. Just said toilet at home. That would have been, been so fine. much cheaper. Yeah. Um, I also think it's really interesting that the writers decide to have this be the first real look we get at Jesus because mm. his scenes with Mary are very short. There's right. very little content, very little said. Yeah. He says her name mm -hmm. and then he shows up at dinner and basically says, you lead it. And he, right. he really says very little. And in this episode, we get like a full half episode or more of like Wendy and the Lost Boys. Uh, and he's just running the show with them and communicating with them. It's our first real conversation we we see. Right. It's interesting that the the right. It seems like the writers, the first thing that they're like communicating to us about Jesus is that he loves children, right? Yeah. And that like let the little children come to me. It's like literally the first thing that's being communicated. Yeah. I think by the by the writers. It's kind of interesting. Because yeah, and it's it's yeah. it's a planting a flag in, in a way. Yeah. Um. Also, but what's also interesting about that is like, that's a period of Jesus's life that we don't really know anything about. Yeah, we don't. Uh, you know, I guess you could say, let's call it, let's just say if it's supposed to be like the year or so before his public ministry starts, it, it sure sounds like that's kind of the implication. Let's just call it the preceding 12 months or so. Sure. That he would be like he is during the, you know, he would, he would be a fully adult version of himself by then. Right. So it's not too hard to infer what he would be like, but it is interesting that we have basically nothing about Jesus's life from yeah. birth to 30. Right. There's the one story of him being 12 uh, that I, I think historical Jesus scholars are like pretty iffy on. Okay. Um, and then there is the gospel of Thomas, which is not canonical and has some stories of like a younger Jesus hmm. and uh, maybe I'll, maybe while we're talking, I'll look up and see if I can find out how he's portrayed in those stories. Cause I actually don't know. I've never read the gospel of Thomas. Yeah. Either have I. Okay. So I'm, I'm slightly wrong. There is another text called the infancy gospel of Thomas. Hmm. This is a, according to chat GPT. So this could be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a, like this, that book depicts him uh, as like having miraculous powers, even when he's young having all this wisdom and authority and knowledge beyond his years, but also being kind of misunderstood, mocked, misinterpreted. Um, he uses his miracle powers to like correct situations, mm. uh, including a resurrection of a dead person. Mm. Um, and then there's hinting at his kind of future role as the Messiah. So uh, yeah, interesting. Interesting. I, yeah. I've never heard of the infancy not, not gospel of Thomas. But, yeah. Yeah. The infancy gospel of Thomas. Who knew? You should probably have someone on the podcast to talk about that. There's got to be somebody. Well, I think those those gospels are written later. Okay. And so they're yeah, thought to be- Yeah, it looks like it says, like, does it say second century or something? Yes. Yeah. And most of those are second or third centuries. The the ones that are like the Gnostic gospels, the ones that are not counted in the in the canon. Yeah. Or most canons or whatever. Um, yeah. Interesting. I wonder what Logos Bible Church would think about the infancy gospel of Thomas. <laughs> I still, it would not be included in their no. word for word, biblical inerrancy. And I'm still hoping to visit Seattle and go there with you. 
at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and That's I'll, a I'll, full I'll, I'll, I'll I will buy lunch after you know after I'm I'm assuming we'll go to the, uh -huh. the ten o'clock or ten thirty service if they have that, and then maybe by eleven thirty or noon we'll be out. Nice tight service, sixty to seventy five minutes, and then yeah, we'll get lunch. I bet it is a short service. Um, kind of jumping off from him with the kids mm -hmm. again, going backwards from the end before the kids show up and even sort of at the beginning right. after just Abigail sees him, it's a small thing, but I love seeing a glimpse of Jesus just doing his thing. Yeah. Like camping, foraging, building, cooking. Yeah. Um, and I, and I thought it was a cool creative decision to have the POV character be the children. Yeah. So like we're seeing it through his eyes and I think it's powerful for, for a similar reason as, as seeing him be good with kids, because it's just like a picture of Jesus. We don't get right. growing up in a, in a real faithful tradition for, you know, for obvious reasons, we're thinking about Jesus divinity and, you know, everybody's all anxious that the kids won't, uh, except Christ in time. And so we're t talking about the crucifixion and resurrection a ton. Um, but I just like seeing him do his yeah. thing. I did. T I did too. And I, it kind of was like also just showing that, that side of Jesus, which is oft has, was often retreating to be by himself, right. Yeah. Or to, you know, mm -hmm. to get away from the crowds. It seems like that was always something, even in Jesus primary, you know, ministry, he was always retreating from the crowds, you know, especially after, you know, after a certain, you know, after certain things happened. And um, I, I love seeing that this, even a couple of years, maybe before that, that that was still a big part of, of who he is, is that he was going to, to kind of have, be by himself, right? And- He all but says, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head yeah. to the kids at one point, right. which is in, in one of the gospels. And so there's something interesting here that is from the previous episode. So one of, one of the things that I'm doing is I am finding moments that spark my interest and then I'm doing a little research mm -hmm. or I'm throwing some stuff in my notes that I that I already know. And one of the one of those moments was at Mary's Shabbat dinner yeah. towards the end of episode 2. We learn th the language they use for Thaddeus and James is that they are students of Jesus, mm. that he is their rabbi. Right. And this is something that we weren't, wasn't really explained to us growing up evangelical. Like I learned it later in reading like N.T. Wright and other people like that. But this is true. This would have been true culturally in that time. Jesus would have started out basically as a rabbi, much like other rabbis with a group of students. Mm. And he could have also been a carpenter or a craftsman right. of some kind. The two were not mutually exclusive. It was actually quite common. Paul was a tent maker and was a Pharisee. He's a rabbi of sorts. And so Jesus would have been, he would have had a trade that that could to totally have been the case historically, culturally. He also would have been extensively educated in all things rabbinical, mm. right? Yeah. And then, and so looking into this, I was like, oh, what were rabbis like, like in what ways was Jesus like and unlike other rabbis? And, and here's kind of a synthesis of, of what I found is that in some, like he was both like other rabbis and unlike other rabbis. Mm. The, the, the parts that were the same is teaching and preaching, uh, being a leader in the community, giving sermons, telling parables, mm. um, and, and kind of working with an extensive knowledge of the Hebrew Bible. That chunk of what we see in the gospel accounts of Jesus would have, nobody would have turned an eye at that. That would have been right. like, this is what rabbis do sure. in our, in our culture. Interesting. Yeah. And, and do they, and, and, and is it also true that like, who would seek who, you know, who out like would, would G that's a good question. You know what I mean? Like I don't, how did someone yeah, become he like calls his disciples? Yeah. Yeah. Well that might, no. So actually I'll answer that here because that kind of gets into the ways in which he was unlike other rabbis. Okay. Uh, as, as he's depicted in the gospels. So he's more itinerant, which then we get the camping stuff in episode three, which is interesting. Mm. He is, he was more focused on the coming arrival of the kingdom of God. Mm. Um, and depending on who you ask the end of the world, mm. um, 
one of the kind of most respected New Testament scholars, um, I forget his first name. His last name is Meyer. His his big thing is that Jesus was the historical Jesus was a failed apocalyptic prophet. Hmm. Uh, that's one way of taking it. N.T. Wright would say, no, he wasn't failed. He wasn't actually predicting the end of the world, but like a new era. But the era. coming of his kingdom, right? Or mm -hmm. And so New Testament scholars will differ on that and, right. and you know, some will agree with one or the other. Um, Jesus was more focused on healing and miracle working than ra other traditional rabbis would have been. He had more radical social teaching hmm. and economic teaching than most rabbis would have had at the time. Interesting. And the fact that he eventually has disciples um, and he demanded more of them than an average rabbi. That's that's another distinction between sure. him. Um, but there were like healers and miracle workers that were more itinerant. So even that part is a bit of a remixing, like a mixing of two known quantities in the first century ancient Near East. Yeah. And even maybe like the move, the move from students to followers, right? Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, what I don't know is how many of those traveling healers and stuff had what we would think of as disciples like Jesus did. Okay. Yeah. That's an interesting question. At some point we probably do need to bring on a new Testament scholar. Let's bring them on. That's seeming kind of inevitable, yeah. right? Probably N.T. Wright or Let's somebody like that. On. Probably just just get, grab Tom. Just ask I Tom. Love that, to, I love to that pop he's on just, with us. I love that he's just Tom. And be, I mean, I don't know him. I've never well, no, but I just Tom. when you when you him. listen to like ask yeah. NT right, that's what they they call him. Everybody calls him Tom. And, and yeah. because he was so unbelievably like respected and revered up until like two years ago, I didn't know that he was still alive. I just thought he was like a. <laughs> but do, but do you know what I mean though? Because it's like he's very much alive. He's so yeah. alive, Tom. I mean, he's like. Yeah, yeah. But I just Super mean like alive. he's so respected and and revered in that world that I thought, oh man, this must be like a guy from like the you know early twentieth century or nineteenth century. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway. Uh, no, he's yeah he's he's alive. He's very alive, and uh, it's you know depending on who depending on who you ask, he's either like one of the most respected New Testament scholars around, or if you ask kind of more liberal Christians and scholars, they'll say he's really good, very talented, but he has some like faith pre-commitments that mm. get in the way of his scholarship. Okay. I've heard, I've heard both. Gotcha. I'm not really in a position to comment yeah. on it one way or the other. I like Tom, but yeah, but yeah no, I, I hear that. I, I found a lot of his stuff extremely helpful yeah. personally. So yeah, I, I will totally. say that. Yeah. So, okay, where should we go from here? There's, I got a lot, yeah, of, I mean, I got a lot of stuff. I mean, I feel like, is there, is there much more we need to, we want to say about, about episode three? It's almost like, it's almost like we should spend the majority yeah. of our time on episode right. two. And I think that there's a couple other things maybe about episode three. Um, there are. I mean, so yeah. I, I don't know, we can, we can jump around. Um I was wondering where so all those kids' parents I got, Yeah, were. I got a couple. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's going to come back. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be some, like, there's going to be hell to pay when the neighborhood association figures out that Jesus has all their children out there all day. Cause they're not, and the kids are like, don't tell anybody. Yes. They make a big point of yeah. that. Um, which is interesting, but, and also sort of foreshadows uh, some of the early miracles right. in the, in the gospel accounts where Jesus is like, don't tell anybody about this. Yeah. And so it's, it's fun to have the kids kind of, um, foreshadow a lot of what we're going to, I imagine we'll see yeah. that the story has adults doing. So there's some really interesting stuff in episode three about like, we finally get a glimpse of what the show is going to say mm -hmm. that Jesus believed about himself. Mm. And this is like just eternally interesting to me, like what the actual person Jesus of Nazareth actually thought. Mm -hmm. But in the show, they have him say the line, glorify me with yourself. Hmm. That's one of the lines he says in the opening solo camping scene. And I feel like, uh, <sighs> I'm so interested in what he thought of himself. My personal sense is that that is an unanswerable set of questions. Probably <laughs> that it's like, we can think about it, but like, I, I mean, do you, do you kind of think of it that way too? Or, or do you feel like as a person of faith, you can be confident that like, no, Jesus knew he was God, yeah. knew he was the Messiah, second person of the Trinity. You know, I mean, people go, people go very far. Some people yeah. think Jesus knew everything God knows. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't think that even if even if I were to go more traditional on the other stuff. Yeah, th this is kind of like an above my pay grade kind of realm, but like I would ha I would have to think that especially because there's so much of the Jesus's life that we that we don't know. You often you even heard him say in this episode, like kind of foreshadowing, but at the beginning of that episode, he said, my time is not yet come or, you know, that kind of, that kind mm -hmm. of thing to the kids. But then he starts to reveal a little bit more towards them later in the episode. But I would think if this is the incar incarnate, um, you know, Christ, that there is an element that of, of him that always knew what was, what was coming, right? That That's at least a, a part yeah. that would at least seem, at least seem in line with what I would would be logic logical to me, although obviously it's so yeah. so mysterious. But if he if he is part of the Trinity, that that must have been in, known to him at least earlier. It's interesting. <laughs> I, I mean, you can you can technically theologically have the crucifixion and resurrection without Jesus knowing much about all that. Mm. I mean, like if you depending on how nerdy you want to get with the justification of sin and all of that. Like you can have the sacrifice if that's how you think of it, regardless of the, the knowledge of the party, uh, you know, and, and there's, it's very interesting. Like if, if you want to say Jesus is fully human, which is the classic formulation right. of, you know, the church councils that basically all, all Christians um, officially believe whether or not they're Full, particularly fully God and, lines up yeah, fully God, fully, fully God, human. fully man. Yeah. And, and so, well, if he's fully man, like, of course that, that is like stated as a paradox, like it is unresolvable, right? That's, that's an item of faith that is not fully explicable. Um, but I think in terms of what we can kind of have confidence about, you know, Jesus didn't write anything down and that's a real limiting factor. He did not choose to write anything himself. Um, we do have a decent sense of who the historical Jesus was. This is my reading of kind of scholarly consensus from new, from historical Jesus scholars. Like we can we know the kinds of things that Jesus taught and did like the real person, um, but not like a level of detail that we can be so confident about what his internal experience was like. We really don't know uh, other than to infer from some of his teachings and the stuff that he focused on. Sure. There's some things that I think we know pretty much incontrovertibly about this. Number one, he decided to become a public figure mm. back to the kind of rabbi thing. Right. So he, so in terms of what he thinks is going on, he is like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start a ministry with me at the center. That that's, that's something right there. Mm -hmm. Number two, he definitely believed that something big was happening. And this is where it can get dicey for believers, right? Like if it's true that he was a failed apocalyptic prophet or something, then maybe he was wrong about the thing that he thought was happening. Mm -hmm. Or if N.T. Wright is right, then he was right about it. And the people who were interpreting him were wrong about what he meant by it, mm -hmm. right? So one or the other, but certainly he thought something big's happening. Kingdom of God is on its way. Yep. Like we know that's what Jesus definitely believed. We know that he called disciples to himself, which again, like puts him in that yep. second, like, kind of more intense category. Sure, that follow me category. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then all of this is connected to his understanding of God and Yahweh, AKA Yahweh through his Judaism. And he would have definitely considered himself a faithful Jew, yeah. a faithful Israelite. Yeah. Um, and so even from there, even if we don't know, like, well, what did he think about his divinity or whatever? How would he have experienced that? Um, even that already is like a lot for me to sink my teeth into psychologically it's, of like, I'm going to do this thing. Yep. Oh, it's, it's, it's so much. And even, even the inter one, an interesting part was hearing him, I think in that third episode, hearing him pray, like, you know, almost like king of the, you know, king of the universe brings sleep to my eyes. I think it was some, it was something like that. I don't know if it was, yeah. in, but just, I believe that those were all meant to be sort of like standard Jewish prayers right. of his, of his time. But hearing yeah. him just just kind of wrapping your mind around god if you will praying yeah. to god um so it's yeah. just it's just it's my, it's all very mind blowing and you know it, it truly is and so, and so seeing it on a screen you know you know obviously with all of its humanity in, involved it still kind of really makes your brain just go wow like this 
some version of this happened, you know, historical Jesus. That's the yeah. cool part is like some version of this really did happen. Yeah. It's quite opaque, of course, but you know, like, Herman Hesse wrote Siddhartha about the Buddha. Yeah. He wrote a novelization of the Buddha's life. Yeah. That doesn't mean like we know exactly what the Buddha was like, but like we can read that novel sure. and it presents like an internally consistent picture yeah. and we can kind of put ourselves in that space for these figures that changed world history incontrovertibly. Yeah. And that's why I will never stop being interested in religion. Jeff, right there. There it is. Um, last thing about, last two things about episode three. Uh, he quotes Isaiah about himself to the kids. Now I'm sure eventually because that this is ultimately an evangelical piece of media, I'm sure that the Jesus we are really ultimately going to get is like, he's the Jesus who basically knows the whole thing. I don't know if he knows about penicillin and the civil war. I don't know that he knows the future or if he knows like that stars are big balls of gas. Like maybe <laughs> Jesus doesn't know that stuff like that nobody knows at the time that he's alive. But I think the picture we're going to get is like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the second person of the Trinity. Yeah. I'm kind of playing this out the way I'm supposed to play it out to accomplish myself slash my father's will on the earth. Mm. But what's interesting is that in this episode, all he does is quote Isaiah 61. And that could be, I'm the promised Messiah, second person of the Trinity, whole kit and caboodle. But it also could be something less that would be a, another um, would still explain the the data that I just rolled out earlier about he just called disciples. You know, he decided to do this thing. It could be something like I'm called by Yahweh to be a prophet to reform Judaism from the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's something that historic or like historical Jesus and New Testament scholars also will talk about sometimes is like. Did Jesus, Jesus at least seems to have seen himself as a reformer, mm. a prophet like figure within Judaism. Mm. And then the, the tricky question for Christians is, can we read back in Christian theological understandings to Jesus? Or do we stop at sort of Jesus as a Jew reforming Judaism? Yeah. But it's like you can at least get that. Mm. And then depending on what you think, you could get the rest. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was interesting, even like, you know, the Wikipedia article says he revealed to the kids that he's the Messiah, but he doesn't actually say that they talk about the Messiah and he says things about it, but like you've seen farther. So you probably know that he, he does. I mean, that is him saying, I'm the I mean, Messiah. I can't, I can't necessarily say that for spoiler <laughs> reasons, but yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's kind of where we're heading. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's where we're heading. Okay. So let's talk about some more stuff from episode two. Um, I don't have, I didn't have a ton of quibbles here, yeah. but from a narrative kind of like believable storytelling perspective, the scene where Nicodemus is with the, the bigger mucky muck there, you know, they're acting as if no one could really believe that anybody could have healed Mary. Mm. Right. And that's kind of the dramatic tension that sends Nicodemus out to, find her. to investigate. Yeah. But like, I don't think that any single healing of Jesus's in the gospels would have been like all that impressive on its own mm. because there were a lot of miracle workers and exorcists in the time of Jesus. Mm. Like, there was like a, a widespread belief in that culture of supernatural intervention in everyday life. That's among Jews. That's among Greco Romans. There are numerous figures in both testaments that do this kind of work. Yeah. Um, Josephus talks, the historian talks about other miracle workers and exorcists like around that time. So that's like a little bit of just like a, I, I caught on that a little mm. bit. I was like, I don't really buy this tension here in this moment yeah. uh it does lead to a very cool scene between nicodemus and mary which maybe we yeah, can talk I think about that was next the, yeah. But yeah did you catch did you catch on that or not necessarily not necessarily that that first part but i i still found the the scene between nicodemus and mary magdalene to be you know the second most impactful scene of the of that episode 
Okay, let's start with yeah. you. I, I have I I got a lot of notes about yeah. it. So he uh, he meet he finds her in like the public square, yeah. and he's like, "You're it's yeah, you, like, it's Lilith." And she's like, "I'm not Lilith right. anymore." So that was kind of the first part is her kind of correcting him about about yeah. her name. But then you know as the as the conversation goes on, and basically Nicodemus kind of being shocked when she gets to the point when she says, well, you know, when he he was kind of getting trying to get her to say like he performed a miracle on her, right? Like, yeah, like when did when did it happen? Like he's trying to yeah, understand. Give me the yeah. timeline. Let me know like when my when my powers really worked on you or or whatever. Yeah. And when did all that hyssop do its totally. thing? And <laughs> but then him being like so sh- like shocked, like shook, if you will, when yeah. when she was like it wasn't you. You know what I mean? And it, you know, she said what'd she say? She goes, you know, it, basically saying like, you, you're not getting credit for this miracle. And then she said, I was one way and now I'm completely different. And that was like, I thought yeah. that was maybe the, maybe the line of the episode. I, I jumped out, uh, that line jumped out to me too. I wrote it down. I have some stuff I want to say about conversion experiences. Um, but I don't know. Do you, do you want to go a little well, deeper? I guess I, like I guess autobiographically I was just, or, or whatever? Yeah, I guess I was just saying like, this is a, not only a, not only a description of this, this conversation between Mary Magdalene and Nicodemus, but also of a born again experience, right? Like exactly. that's, yeah. that's, like, yeah. that's what they're pointing to. And Have you had one of those? Like, do you, do you identify as having like, not as being a born again Christian yeah. in the sort of theological sense, but like, did you have a, any sort of radical conversion yourself? Well, because, you know, because I grew up in church, I, I would say, right. I would say, you know, I, you know, I, I said that the sinner, you know, the sinner's prayer probably at, at five or six years old. And then, and right. then because of like, Same. and then because of like nineties Christianity and it's kind of focus on like, you know, hell and end times, which you've talked quite a bit, I would kind of get like, um, resaved probably every night at, you know, 10 30 or 11 PM while my parents were watching mash, I would just kind of come downstairs and be like, Hey, can we just, can we just do this one more time? Can we just like, do let's this just, again? We'll just let's really make sure, make sure this is the, the real thing. Um, oh, so that's kind of sad, I know. but so, so all that to say is I don't think I had necessarily like a true conversion experience as a kid, but I would say as my, as my faith, especially in times where I may have probably walked away from my faith a, a little bit more and, you know, went through a season of kind of, um, yeah. Because of your rock and roll lifestyle. My rock and roll lifestyle might've affected this in some ways, but, but bit. I would say in, in dramatic terms, coming back to, coming back to Christ, you know, in my, in more of my, um, in my adult life, um, I can see, I can see the difference. I can relate to the line. I was, I was one yeah. way and now I'm, now I'm different. Um, yeah. so, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was a dramatic, you know, conversion experience. I would say it's over, over years and much of it having to do with my, you know, intentional movement towards Christ, right? Like, um, yeah. As opposed to times when I was intentionally moving away or intentionally, you know, or letting my doubt or, or different things kind of, um, you know, keep that at an arm's length. Um, so all that to say is no, not necessarily, but I, I, I relate to the line that, that Mary said, if it's possible for both. And we grew up hearing these we stories, did. Yep. right? These conversion yep. stories. I could imagine like a post evangelical or an ex evangelical kind of rolling their eyes at that sure. line. I was one way. Now I'm completely different. And what happened in between was him. Yeah. That was, that was sure. the line. Yeah. Right. And so, oh, so yes, I will know him for the rest of my life. That's, that's what she says. Um, like I could see someone feeling like they've put a modern evangelical conversion story testimony into an ancient character's mouth, mm. but I would gently push back on sure. that. Um, these kinds of conversions from a scientific and anthropological perspective are absolutely real. Mm. Uh, sociologists of religion have been cataloging dramatic conversions since the beginning of the sociology yeah. of religion. William James has a chapter on it in the varieties of religious experience from like 1908, yeah. uh, the, the, one of the fathers of modern psychology and, uh, modern religious studies. Yeah. 
as well. So as far back as people are carefully studying religion yeah. in what we, in like a modern scientific way, like radical conversions are part of it. I have many For friends sure. who have these stories. Um, and so I did a little research, uh, and, uh, I wanted to kind of throw some of this in here. I have like 10 bullet points. Go, hey, please. <laughs> so you can, you jump in at any point. Yeah. You do not have to let me get through all of these. Yeah. But I, I find dramatic conversion stories to be so interesting, not not least because they were at the center of the evangelicalism I had growing yeah. up. And I think a big reason for that is that my, the evangelicalism I had was a direct descendant of the 1970s Jesus movement. And that for was sure. a movement characterized by young people getting dramatically converted, most of them from Catholicism and Presbyterianism and all that stuff, well, but not all. Well, I was going to say that would be the story of my my parents, right? In the in the late seventies, yep. in that movement, even in at this big church in Buffalo, New York, um, having that type of conversion conversion experience that was very common for for many of my parents' friends and them themselves during that time from Catholicism, like you mentioned, especially in Buffalo. Buffalo yeah. is very Catholic. Um, Catholic town. Mm. Yeah. Different, yeah. different vibes on the East yeah. coast, right. With more Catholicism. Mm -hmm. I mean, my parents were like both raised Lutheran. And so I think their involvement in the, they met doing young life, which is a parachurch organization yeah, yeah. that came out of the Jesus movement. Uh, they met in California doing that. And so they, you know, they were definitely of that generation and, and our church fit pretty squarely within that world. Uh, but they didn't have that kind of Catholic cultural context. Right. And anyway, so these conversion, um, these conversions, which, uh, you know, there have been extensively studied. Here's a bunch of things. And after each one, I'll leave a little space yeah. and if you can say something if you want. Yeah. And if not, we'll just cut out the space sure. and I'll keep going. Yeah. Okay. All right. Dramatic conversion experiences are typically characterized by a sudden and intense sense of of transformation where individuals often describe a profound change in their beliefs, values, and sense of self. Yes. <laughs> you agree? <I> agree. <laughs> <laughs> These experiences are usually accompanied by strong emotions, mm -hmm. such as overwhelming joy, relief, awe, or a sense of peace and clarity. Just keep going. I I'm just enjoying this. Many dramatic conversions have mystical or supernatural elements where individuals feel a direct encounter with the divine or a higher power. Um, so that's kind of the opening three. That was like, yeah. this is what this looks like. This is the, the phenomenological experience of this by people. And, you know, you and I know individuals who've had this experience. It didn't happen to either yeah. of us, but it's kind of seen as the paragon. And I think there's some problems there. Um, by the way, uh, this is not in my no this this most recent research, but I know it from previous interviews on you have permission. There is interesting research on conversion experiences. People who have insecure attachment as adults mm. appear to be more likely to have dramatic conversion experiences. Really? Okay, that basically a worse childhood with without um, a secure attached caregiver or parent. Yeah which is one of the leading predictors of a good adult yeah. life, basically, as a, as a kid, do you have that? And so they're, they're just, there's a higher preponderance of dramatic conversions for people, basically with shittier lives is one way of saying it, which makes sense, right? Yeah, sure. Um, but there's also- Maybe like more uh, open- there, more, Are we gonna get to the neuro? I was gonna say maybe like more open to some, something new or, or a, a, a- Well, exactly, yeah. this isn't this working. Isn't, this is not good. Right. Yeah. And for some, but there's interesting stuff for some of those people, they stay, then they, they can become securely attached to God mm -hmm. or their idea of God. Some of them stay that way, but many of them actually revert back and, and back oh, to difficult okay. experiences of their life. So it doesn't always stick for those people. Yeah. And you could think of that in terms of just the difficulty of re rewiring a brain yeah. would be one way of thinking about why that would be difficult for someone. Yeah. Okay. Psychologists like Leon Festinger suggest that dramatic conversions can resolve cognitive dissonance where conflicting beliefs or behaviors create psychological tension. Mm. Now this sounds to me like your, what you mentioned, like kind of straying away for a while, sure. 
Uh, when Jaffrey and I met, we describe it as we were both in a rebellious phase yes, with our yes, faith. You've ba- back, back so you get into that phase. Yeah, what, well, I mean, not, whatever. But, I, that, I'm, that might be too strong, too strong but, of language that I'd use today. But you know but, the language yeah. that was, I think, often you used probably at, when, we were, when we were teenagers, right? I, I would think. Yes. Oh, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. But so this is interesting. Festinger is saying like, one thing that might be going on is that someone is actually living with a, a lot of cognitive dissonance and that might be around moral choices, ethics, but it could be other things yeah. like, I don't know, like what you believe about your parents or something right. like that. And then this thing comes in, creates harmony. You, you drop it, you let it go. You say yes to, to God and you resolve that cognitive dissonance yeah. and you resolve that tension. Yeah. And that's part of what's happening yeah. in that feeling of unity sure. and, and like, a. Um, integration of oneself. Yeah. It's very interesting. It is interesting. And I also wonder, you know, I don't know if when you were younger, did you ever go to any of those real kind of like emotionally driven sort of youth, you know, events or like, um, yeah, it, I, I was at a couple arenas yeah. with 30,000 yeah, where everyone would kind of people. go to the, go yeah. to the, the altar and sort of, you know, maybe a, you'd bring yeah. your CDs and in, in, in all your secular CDs and throw them. <laughs> <laughs> Burn my Metallica yeah, albums. Like your Green Day albums and everything. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah. sometimes you wonder if those, you sort of mentioned this, but those real emotional, maybe also driven by the people around you, experiences where everyone is moving in one direction, you know, who, who's that going, are they going to stick with, with everyone when there might've been an experience, but it was also driven by, you know, you know, positive yeah. peer pressure or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned, uh, insecure attachment, but there's also evidence that just significant life stressors yeah. or crises in life, uh, make people more susceptible to a dramatic conversion. Mm-hmm. Susceptible sounds like it's a bad no. thing. Generally, these are these positive are good, experiences yeah. in people's lives more likely to happen. And that conversion can help people with a sense of purpose, direction, sure. resolution to those struggles. I mean, this is this is just clinical language for, you know, the it is not the it is not the healthy who need a physician, but the sick, sick yeah. right? To quote mm-hmm. Jesus, um, this is very straightforward. Conversion experiences often lead to a redefinition of personal identity, and psychologists like my beloved William James have noted that such experiences can result in a quote new self that feels more authentic and aligned with the individual's beliefs and values. So this is kind of related to that cognitive sure. dissonance yeah. point that like there can be, oh, and this actually came up. Um, I did a video uh, and it was also released as a podcast, maybe f- three or four months ago about meaning making yes, after catastrophe. I was just going to say something about meaning making. Yeah. Go no, for I mean, I, I not much beyond that, but a lot of this, I would think a lot of this would come from the, the, within the search for, for meaning or, or desire for creating meaning in one's yeah. life where there maybe was not before. One of the ways that people with a religious tradition of any kind might make meaning and, and do make meaning sometimes after catastrophes is to basically ascribe the catastrophe to a misalignment between actions and mm-hmm. values. So you could imagine that at an individual level, right? So God allowed me to suffer this way because I haven't been living rightly, right? And then that person might go, I'm going to rededicate my life to Christ. Mm-hmm. Now, we might have a problem with, with some of that from some perspective, but crucially what I would say from a therapist perspective is if that rededication is in line with their actual values, then I don't have any problem with Mm. that at all. If they're kind of forcing a different narrative on themselves, maybe that they don't actually buy, then we're getting into what's called extrinsically motivated religion or religiosity versus intrinsically, which is when you do it for your own Mm. reasons. And that's where all the benefits are. That's really what religion is for is for people being, in my opinion, being intrinsically motivated within themselves to do it. Extrinsic feeling pressure from outside, feeling fear of judgment mm-hmm. or whatever. It doesn't work as yeah. well. Doesn't create the same kind of faith experience, but imagine you can also imagine this at the societal level. So there's evidence from after Katrina of a lot of displaced people saying, you know, I think that this was a wake up call by God kind of a thing, not necessarily like a punishment, sure. but like a, Hey, live right. And 
I, I think of a lot of biblical passages through this lens of meaning making after catastrophe. You think about the Israelites in exile. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that Isaiah passage that Jesus is quoting in episode three comes from the post exilic period, probably that's what they think. And it's the Israelites making sense of the exile to Babylon. And like when the prophets would come and speak to Israel about how to return to the promised land, how to get back in Yahweh's good graces, it would usually involve this kind of like a renewed morality and ethics that is like, let's realign ourselves with the values we already have. It's not like new teachings, right? right? It's not, it isn't like, oh, I'll tell you what will help you that you've never thought mm. of before. And so in that way, it's similar to what sure. you were describing, the, the period, those periods of our yeah. lives where it's like, no, I, sh fuck, I should do better at that. Well, I, I should go I, back to that. I like, know, I know, right. yeah. I know. Like, I know that this is probably, at least in my, in my mind and, you know, be better for me or the, or the, the better path for me. Right. Um, and, yeah. but he had to, had to just, had to find it on my own in order for it to kind of stick, I think. Well, and that's, that's what I was saying therapeutically yeah. about it. If it's your values, then that yeah. works. Um, but it's like, it's the reason that therapists don't tend to give advice. Mm. It doesn't work. Yeah. You have to figure, <laughs> you, the, you have the to figure it out. The client has to figure, you got to figure yeah. it out. Yes. You, and then you'll want to do it because you came yeah. to it organically. Totally. Right. And so you can imagine the same thing at a corporate sort of nationwide level. Um, okay, a little bit more on conversions. Neuropsychological research indicates that dramatic religious experiences can involve changes in brain activity, particularly in areas associated with emotions, self-awareness, and perception. For instance, the temporal lobe has been implicated in intense religious experiences. So we have evidence that these dramatic conversions actually change people's wow. brains. So this is, and of course they do, right? Because if they change our behaviors and our feelings and whatever, yeah, like that's, that's the wiring. You know, yeah. There are correlates of that in yeah. our brain somewhere, somehow, or certainly in our mind, which emerges from our brain, that language can get tricky. Um, and then this is interesting to kind of put it into a cultural narrative. So Jesus, whether he thought of himself as God as a reformer of Judaism, or maybe as both, um, cultural narratives and expectations about religious experiences can shape how people interpret and report their conversions. Mm. And different cultures have different modes of what counts as a legitimate conversion experience. But so Mary, this is where I love it connecting with narrative, after Mary's experience of being healed from much of her PTSD by Jesus. That's the language I'm okay. going to use for it. Uh, she returns to the faith of her right. youth and she quotes the words at her Shabbat dinner. You know, she's like from her dad from the first episode. It's like in her culture, if something like this happens yep. to you, what that means is you go back to the source and you know what the yes. source is. And also related to identity, which we talked about returning to her name, right? Like her, her actual name, which was, you know what yes, I mean? So like- Exactly, the Mary name and right. not Lilith, so it's like right. I, I, A nice little yeah, like dramatic I no tool. longer identify with this. I now, I, I once again yeah. identify with this or, or for the first time, you know, however you want to look at it. This is, this is also a reason that people say that religion is by definition at its core, small C conservative. Hmm. Not conservative as in the Republican yeah. Party, but conservative in like, you know, when like for a long time, it's 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 finally not happening in America at the same level. But it's still been a trope that like when you have kids, you go back to church. Yeah. Right. You don't like yeah, did, change. Didn't, religions. You, didn't you sort of say that like in some ways? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure. doing and, it right and, now. I'm absolutely and I'm sure doing that. That that, and, that might rub some people the wrong way. But but at the same time, sure like, it will. Well, that's OK if they think that. But se but secondly, there is something about that as you as you as your kids begin to enter the world that that it kind of I don't know I don't know about reawakens but it makes you really consider everything about their their day to day what they're hearing who they're with um, what they're experiencing on a on a weekend on a Sunday 
Um, yeah. I don't know. I can, yeah. re- I can relate to that. I never really left church, but I can imagine that, yeah. you know, with kids, you're reconsidering those things quite a bit. I've taken many breaks, yeah. multiple breaks yeah. from church. Um, but yeah, like, like, and that part of me is the conservative part and I'm okay with having a part of myself that is conservative. Sure. There's also the part of me that's progressive yeah. and those are in conversation with each other, in tension with each other. Uh, one last thing on conversions before we talk about Nico and his wife, because we have a great Nicodemus yeah. and wife interaction. Um, some, of course, some psychologists, scientists, neurologists, whoever are skeptical of like the supernatural elements of conversion experiences, obviously. And they want to attribute them to like psychological, social, neurological factors rather than divine intervention. I just want to say, that's why it's good that there are Christians like me, Hmm. Jeff. It's the same to me. The natural event is the event of God Hmm. working the way I see things. Uh, I, I, I share the quote supernatural skepticism, but that does not lead to me downplaying conversion experiences at all, because for me, supernatural is so natural. All, there's no, I don't, I don't believe there's a yeah. distinction. Um, and so God works through the natural, the natural because the natural, uh, like I, I am what is technically called a non-reductive physicalist. Okay. If you want to get nerdy about it, which is just that there's not like other substance mm. besides physical. I mean, as far okay. as we know, right. I mean, this is just, in 2024, I'm a non-reductive physicalist, but if I lived in yeah. 2000 or if I lived in 2200, 324, yeah. I probably would have but a different you, But you're right. But currently um, you are an NRP. But currently yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I'm an NRP. I wonder what I, I, wonder what uh, I am. What and, I mean, we'll have to figure out what, what else there is out there. Well, really quick, you can be a dual, a substance dualist. That's to say that like soul and mind or whatever are separate from physical material and they have their own kind of rules or laws. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people who are like very uh, like strongly pro-life are effectively substance dualists. And they think that like at conception or at some other point, like a soul comes into Mm -hmm. being and there wasn't a soul before then. Right. So that's a reason to be pro-life that kind of pro-life. Uh, And then there's like reductive physicalism, which is just like, it's all just matter and everything is chance and whatever. Non-reductive physicalism is like, no, genuinely new things emerge out of complexity. Mm. So like consciousness emerges out of a very complex brain, but it's not reducible to neurons. Like it is its own separate thing, but it, it comes from the physical mm. stuff. Okay. That's a very short okay. way of saying it. That's my Got view. It. Okay. I want to talk about this Nicodemus and wife conversation. Cause it's my favorite uh, between them. They've already, we've already, we already had, had, had a, a good one ones. with them in the, in the first episode, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you know which one I'm talking about where they're doing the, the high, low aesthetics, the beauty, a all little that stuff? Bit. It, it didn't, it's not in my, it's in my notes. So let's, let's talk about it. It's not in my notes. So I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we overhear people talking, and I'm using closed caption, which helps. We hear some chatter about these solid gold plates yes. and the way that these other vessels have to be cured for extra time. Basically, these luxury sure. items that are used in yeah. their Shabbat dinner. And it's it's basically the Portlandia sketch where the restaurant has official papers <laughs> yeah. for each chicken that they're going to eat. We were, I was talking to a friend about Portlandia <laughs> uh, this morning, and we, you know, women and women first, and I was just... I was just, I was just, I just had <laughs> such good memories of that first. show. Yeah. <laughs> so good. It's so, it's so good. good. Yeah. Uh, Carrie and um, Fred, amazing. National Treasures. So Nico is looking at this beautiful tapestry mm. with chagrin. And at first I thought, I okay, love that you call him go. Nico, by the way. We're going to get, I know. Well, that's what his oh, wife calls oh, okay. him. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, more fun it. than saying Nicodemus. Yeah, yeah she hey, calls Nico. him that in the first episode. Uh, what's up, hey, Nico? What's up, Nico? And I'm, I'm thinking... Okay, here we go. We're going to get some typical like evangelical anti-Catholicism okay. here of like a, hey, all we need is a wood table. We don't need any of this beauty. The beautiful, ornate, ritualistic, and dead religiosity contrasted with the vibrant, alive, populist, personal relationship stuff. And Nicodemus is thinking about, he's looking at this tapestry 
and thinking that this heretofore unknown miracle worker was more effective than he was, despite his station, right. despite having access again to the finest mm -hmm. hyssop <laughs> available in Definitely. the first century. He's thinking maybe all of this ornamentation is actually keeping people from mm. God. And if we had stopped there, wow. that is just like just pure evangelicalism directed straight into the bloodstream. But then his wife comes over and she asks a great question about the particular tapestry. She says, should the artist have made it less oh, yes. beautiful? I remember that's such a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I rem now I, rem I remember this. And it makes me think about like being in cathedrals yes. in Europe and stuff. I don't know. I don't know how much of that kind of um, like high Christian art yeah. you've seen. I've seen some of it. Um, you know, Sherwood, we, we toured Europe a few times and I've been a couple other times. And so I've been to a few of these cathedrals and you, you know, you even see some of it on the East yeah. coast and stuff like in yeah. Boston and New York, there's some old mm -hmm. cathedrals and, um, or art, you know, For sure. museums and stuff. And a lot of beautiful Christian art, like our art in general, like, Oh, should, should like it not be beautiful. Right. <laughs> like, I, I just, it's, there's a real tension there. I think within religion and Christianity, uh, in particular of like, Hey, how much is this just about brass tacks mm -hmm. for the poor? And how much of this is like aesthetic, luxurious exaltation. Right. And you know, the, it makes me think of the story of the, the jar of perfume being, which maybe will show mm -hmm. up in the chosen of, Hey, why don't we sell this and give it to the poor says wow. Judas. And Jesus is like, Hey, I'm here for a short time. And that's kind of like, yeah, should it, should they have made it yeah. less beautiful? I, that that was that's such a moving question and do you, i don't remember but do you remember how nico responded to that he basically was like Touché, Touché. like you got me okay yeah. he he was like good yeah. good point yeah and then and then i think when we get that cross cut by the way that's when uh or is it cross cutting or jump cutting i think yeah. it's cross cutting where there are three things happening at the same time and the camera is going in yeah. between them uh, famously the Godfather execution yes. scene at the end during, during little Michael's, uh, yes. baptism yeah, or where confirmation every, everyone else or whatever is getting, it is, you know, taken out. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. goosebumps. So during that, I think Nico has kind of settled in and he is like, okay, I, this is my role. I'm, I'm yeah. at this one, but I love that cutting with the other two yeah. Shabbat dinners. Um, okay. I'm wondering if there's anything else, like I definitely wanted to talk about because yeah, we're, we're, we're getting to the end here. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, the Nic Nicodemus and Mar Mary Magdalene kind of discussion. Just, I mean, just, did we want to talk at all about just Jesus arriving at dinner? Like, um, I mean, we talked a little bit about it, but there's, there's, al there's almost a, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's yeah, a, there's cool almost moment. a hint of like, you know, what, what was also evident in episode three with just sort of like, he was often alone, right? Like he was, he must have been alone up until this point and 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 then knocked on their door. I mean, do we know how he knew about this um dinner? Or was it because a couple well, of his my, guys my were there? My guess is that he found out about it and he told Thaddeus yeah. and okay. James gotcha. is what I that's yeah. what I took it to mean. And then he showed yeah. up later, but maybe didn't tell them that yeah. he was coming. Um yeah, I liked that. There's actually okay, I have a couple things I, that I kind of teased at the beginning. I want to mm -hmm. hit them real quick. So they're they're portraying Matthew as autistic. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, and I I looked into this and like, yep, that's that's what I found online. Uh, this is not based on any historical or textual evidence, but it's an interesting choice creatively. Um, and I kind of see no reason not to try something out like this, especially since the text doesn't really give any indication either way. Like, it seems like more interesting from a TV mm -hmm. writing perspective. And I just wrote that we we saw it with his interactions with Lex yeah. Luthor. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Megamind. Sorry, yeah. Quintus. Uh, you know, the, very literal, very good with details. Not yeah, really just clued to in these... to the heavy implication that this is not a good idea. Right. And just you to know? give these characters yeah. um, other elements of huma humanity, right? Yeah. Like, and yeah, we, we don't we don't know yeah. for sure, but I, I do think it's an interesting element, and that will be that comes up again, you know, as as we move as we move forward and. Yeah, I, I I like that being written in. 
And I, I like to similarly the way that even after her healing, Mary is still showing some signs of PTSD. Specifically, she's showing yes. avoidance, like wanting to avoid thinking yeah. about the trauma, the years living that quote possessed yeah. life. And I, I just I love the realism in that. I, I feel like that was probably intentional by the writers to sort of treat it, treat it as PTSD. Sure. And, you know, there's interesting questions for people of faith, like, well, do I think it's a demon or PTSD or is it sure. both? And I don't know, and I don't, yeah, I, don't I don't really care, don't. but I, I do know that we, that PTSD is real because sure, I treat yeah. it right. every week with my clients. And so, uh, that's, I love that as like, well, let's well, sure, tell even, it that and even way. if the, de- if the demons um, were yeah. real, having PTSD from that seems likely, right. Or possible. Right. right. Yeah. It, it, would, it work. would work either from the sexual trauma or from the trauma sure. of possession. Yeah. In, in either case that would yeah. work. You're right. Um, And then uh, I did mention really quick that I mentioned we would talk about these family and romantic norms in the first Mm -hmm. century. So really quickly, Matthew has been something like disowned, Mm -hmm. at least by his father. Uh, It does appear that the the Shabbat dinner he's walking up to is his family. So I don't know if he's been like fully disowned. Maybe that will become clear later. But that would have been brutal in that time and place. To be disowned. And it had me thinking of the prodigal yeah. son and I'm just like, Oh, interesting. I wonder if, I wonder, I wonder if we'll get a moment where Matthew is like reacting to the story mm. of the prodigal son, like in a later episode. I can't confirm cool or, de- I can't confirm or deny. Oh, 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 am I just calling well, shots not left and right here? And you already lost that one game. Okay. So I wouldn't be too confident. Yeah, that's true. I, I <laughs> totally lost the Shabbat game. Um, and by the way, I did a little digging there. The broader historical and cultural context of the first century does suggest that tax collectors were often socially Mm -hmm. marginalized, which could imply strained family relationships. It's not specifically mentioned in his case, just like the neurodivergence, but that's interesting. Interesting storytelling choice. Yeah. And then the one last thing about norms. So because of Nicodemus and his wife and because of Simon and Eden being so buddy, buddy and like intimate, in the intimate and just a general sort of like close knit way. I was like, do I buy that these first century marriages when women were literally property would really be so mm. warm and Western feeling, you know, given all this patriarchy. Uh, but I did some digging again and there are accounts of very warm romances and marriages in both mm. Jewish texts and in the Greco, larger Greco, larger yeah. Greco Roman world. So probably not as ubiquitous as we would find yeah. these days because, you know, like our world is more equal sure. between men and women, but also our world is a lot more shaped by medieval romance, which is, you know, in the middle ages is when the kind of modern love story is, is born and they're living yeah. before that. Um, but it's not yeah. at odds with what historians say. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go with it and I, I'm, it's, I'm not going to catch too much. And I think I'll be able to enjoy that part I think of the you show. Should enjoy it. And um, yeah, no, I, I remember we talked a little bit about that last time is like when there was that, there was that yeah. um, interaction between who was it between, it was, it was also Simon, that was between and, his wife. Simon yeah. and Eden. And yeah. we, we, you kind of commented on that first, like kind of wondering like, would there be that much of kind of like a back and forth yeah. and um, you know, talking about her family and all that kind of stuff. And um yeah, so yeah. that's interesting. I I think the only other thing I, I I had thought about was just just this idea of Shabbat and just kind of almost like it it, oh, it just made me kind on. of long and and we've even me, oh, just long for totally. these like sacred days or sacred things or Im, immovable um, parts of the week, right? Like I, I know you know yeah yeah we're actually my friends and I we have something this week that we're that we try to do once in a while, just called Sabbath dinner. We don't necessarily have, you know, our followings every a, day, a full day of rest before or after it, but it's just a, it's a way of us, yeah. it's a way of us kind good. of coming, coming together <laughs> and having, you know, taking communion Love together it. and maybe even just reading a little scripture together. And we do yeah. it with our kids too, but it happens like yeah. if we're lucky, it's like a, a quarterly thing, or maybe, you know, once every, you know, mm. six or eight weeks, but it made me kind of long for just that, 
you know, that sacred day within, within our busy lives. And, and if, if there was ever a culture who needed that more than anyone, it seems like it's us. And, and finding, how do we, you know, how do I make room for, for that and say no to more things? And, you know, we've even talked, you know, just in scheduling difficulties and, and things like that. Like, how do we, how do we make space in, in our lives? And it seemed like not only did these people have simpler lives, even with, even on top of their simple life, this was this was the highlight of their week. They weren't trying to squeeze this in. This was kind of like the culminating moment. It's the first thing that Mary decides to do yeah. after she's healed is right. host Shabbat dinner, which yeah. I think so is telling. Th- that was just one other thing that really stood out to me is like, ah, oh, there's just something so beautiful about this day uh, of of rest, right? And this day of coming together. Um, you're reminding me of, of the last two things <laughs> I'll say <laughs> that I wrote down about this. Okay. The first is just, I wrote down when they're reading the text, yeah, the Kiddush right. is what it's called. I just wrote, man, I love religion. Right? Uh, just like, you know, blessed are you, Beautiful. Lord God, King of the universe who creates the fruit yeah. of the vine who has sanctified us, you know, like, it's just like, ah. Yeah. Oh, this is just it, in me. It is. I was raised with it. It's not fucking you going anywhere. Escape. It's in me. And then I'll, I'll end a bit more pedantic and yeah. less poetic than that. One more kind of social sciences okay. thing here, no, this is, that's, which that's is my, jam. which is really my, yeah. uh, my want. Yeah, it's my jam. So before Jesus shows up at that Shabbat dinner, Thaddeus and James show up and they don't really say why they just were told right. it was a good place yeah. that they could come. That's what they say. She welcomes them in. And this made me think about one of the big value adds of religious Mm. communities. Um, And researchers have identified this. This isn't just my own stuff. Um, But of course, religious people, we know this instinctually, that the identification that believers share with each other across other divides offers this very natural way to begin relationship. And it's not easy to begin relationships no. with other people if you don't know them already, if they're not related to you or married to someone that you already know or whatever. It's hard mm-hmm. to do that, right? And so the Shabbat dinner or any other religious event, it's this shared ritual in their mm-hmm. community. So even though she's kind of like struggling through the specifics as she comes back to her faith, it's still like regardless of how well mm-hmm. she does it, right. air quotes, It's an excuse to meet people, to share a meal. It's like these days, a church potluck where a newcomer is just as welcome as a longtime member. And, you know, these ways of meeting, of course, they exist outside religion. I'm not I'm not saying that that's the only way to meet people, but the shared beliefs and identity, the shared ritual of it, it kind of greases the wheels. And so if you are a person who is tremendously lonely and needs community If you're a Christian, go to a fucking Christian church potluck and you will meet 20 people who will be at least open to the idea of being kind to you because it's built in to the community. And that is just literally priceless. It's beautiful. And I've even heard you on some of your episodes with, you know, you know, you have kind of still Christian episodes, but you also have people who have kind of, you know, walked away and and some of them have just have mentioned that is one of the main things that they miss, right? Is the is the community. And yeah. when I talk about a lot of my busyness, a lot of my busyness comes from church and those types of things, which sometimes feels like a lot, but it's also the richness of it, right? Like having that community, yeah. like even our church, yeah. which is a pretty modern, you know, evangelical church, we still did something this past Sunday, which we we only do a couple times a year, which felt very kind of like, you know, 90s potluck ish, but we just call it like a get to know you dinner. Mm -hmm. And like two two or three times a year, we invite people who are new to the church to come and just have dinner. We had like mission barbecue and just get to know, you know, some of the, you know, you know, leaders of the church and longstanding folks there. But it just feels like a like a hangout for, you know, an hour or an hour and a half. And it seems so meaningful to these people who are looking for that, right? Like, you know, hopefully they're they're not there just for community, but that's got to be a big piece of it. E- I mean, even if I'm they okay were. with them yes. being there. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> I mean, you, like take it outside of Christianity. Like imagine sure. a Muslim immigrant shows up and it's like, they find the yes. local mosque. What a fucking relief yeah, right. that must be. 
like, you know, to, to be able to plug in. Um, and I, you know, that stuff, those, those, you know, in, in the evangelical world, like some of those events, the ways that those can be done sometimes I recognize for a lot of my listeners and even in my own story that, you know, it can sure. be so cringy. I remember one time my mom and I went to something in a park in San Jose, downtown San Jose, a lower income area of the city. And they were giving away all these like backpacks with mm -hmm. school supplies and all this stuff. And they made everybody sit mm. through a sermon before yeah. they would give it to them. And like yeah. we left, yeah. like, ah, you don't you have, don't, to, do you don't that. have yeah. to do it that way, you know? Uh, and so there's better and worse ways to do this. But the point is just that the, yeah, the, the shared rituals with those beliefs and identity stuff there, it is just, it makes it so much easier, so much easier for one human being to get connected to a bunch totally. of other human beings that may, that might give that person fairly unconditional yeah. love and acceptance. And that is the number one thing yeah. we need as human beings. So from just my therapist perspective, I'm like, I am very often working with people on getting them involved in a church. If that's mm -hmm. something that they're interested in doing, because it's like five birds it, with it one stone. It truly is. And it can be so, it can be so meaningful, especially for folks who are kind of missing that element of, of community. And, and there was that piece just about that that Shabbat dinner that you could just tell that a, a large piece of that is, is the coming together of folks who, who love each other. Right. And, um, I, re I really, yeah. I really loved that dinner scene and it was, you know, it's kind of inspiring to me. Same. It makes me want to do something like yeah, you're doing I, with if your I lived friends. in Seattle uh, and we were coming back from, a, you know, a day at Logos Bible church, Logos I, I would Bible think church, that we could, yeah. later that night day. we would go to your house and I would bring, <laughs> you know, muffins and coffee. And I, I could only imagine, <laughs> I could only imagine is also, <laughs> yeah, maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus would just oh, show man. up. Maybe, you know, not, not literally. literally. Um, okay. Th well, this is super fun. I, um, I, I might need to cut down my notes for the future. I, I think there will be less, I think yeah, just we're just getting early accustomed episodes, to the, there's just so much totally. stuff. There and I think we're getting too. accustomed to the characters, yeah. the culture, the, yeah. you know, so I, I think, yeah, I think some of these will be maybe a little quicker and we won't be talking about certain things as much, but it makes sense for the first three episodes, right? Yeah. Give us a break, people. Yeah, yeah. Man, Seriously, tough, just tough, chill out in the three. comments, everybody. Um, okay, well, please send some some feedback. Like I shared some at the beginning of the episode. That's really cool to hear from other people and incorporate some of those insights into our uh, analysis. We went a little longer this week, but this was fun and I love it. And I'm looking forward to next Thanks, one. Dan. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.